The mission of the University of Dayton Speaker Series, now in its second season, is to serve as a catalyst for purposeful and critical discussion of contemporary issues through dynamic public presentations and related programming, some of which we were uh, able to enjoy this afternoon with Dr. Alexander. This evening's speaker promises to contribute powerfully to this mission and to this year's theme for our series, Education for Transformation. Note that this evening's event is also featured as part of a week of special programming organized by UD Students for Human Rights Week. And more details are included uh, on a little card that was being distributed to students um, at the doorway. Thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. We appreciate your openness to learn new things, to consider difficult issues, and to work together to build a more just and inclusive community and society as well as a truly transformative educational experience. I especially want to welcome then all those students for whom this is the first major speaker event on campus. I encourage you to settle in and open your minds for a thought-provoking evening, including a brief question and answer period following Dr. Alexander's formal remarks. We should wrap up by 8.30, 8.45 at the latest, leaving us time for a book signing at the end. I also want to offer special recognition to those who've come from the Dayton community uh, to campus to join us this evening. We value your partnership as we commit together to engaging in purposeful and critical discussion of contemporary issues. We hope you'll come back to campus for many more talks in the future. Our next event in the series uh, with Nicholas Kristoff, the uh, renowned journalist, is featured on the back of your program. And we are currently planning another exciting roster of speakers for the 2013-14 series. Uh, as I now invite Dr. Leslie Pika from the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work uh, to come to the stage to introduce Dr. Alexander, I would ask you to please silence all noise-making devices. Thank you. Thank you and good evening, and I appreciate this opportunity. As February is Black History Month, it's very fitting to have a scholar, Professor Alexander, here to talk about our atrocious racial horrors of the past and how they are still perpetuated today and how we are still living with the consequences today. In her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, she argues that, quote, we have not ended racial caste in America, we have merely redesigned it. And I have to say that I love UD, and I want a t-shirt, uh, because we don't just talk about this in the month of February. I want to tell you about a conference that will take place here at UD in three weeks in March. I'm the faculty advisor for a student-led conference, Consciousness Rising, which will take place Thursday, March 7th through Saturday, March 9th. Uh, and you're all invited. Isn't that great? Uh, Consciousness Rising 2013 is the second annual social justice conference for University of Dayton students, staff, faculty, and the broader community. It's sponsored by the Office of the President and is in part a partnership with students, staff, and faculty across the university, such as the Office of Multicultural Affairs, the Provost's Office, Jack Ling, and many, many others who have been hard work organizing this conference. The theme for the conference this year is effects of structural inequality, and a strong emphasis will be on domestic and international racial ethnic relations and improving the campus climate. And we've got a lot of great events planned, uh, including interactive student events, workshops, dialogue groups, presentations, to provide resources as a means of empowering each of us to action. As you leave here tonight, you'll see students holding up these uh, yellow half sheet flyers with some of the events. I just want to tell you briefly um, about a few of them on Thursday. March 7th at 7.30 p.m. in Sears Recital Hall. Sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva will give his presentation uh, entitled New Racism, Colorblindness, and the Sweet but Wrong Myth of Universalism in Historically White Colleges and Universities. And this is also the annual uh, Saxton AKD address organized by the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work and Criminal Justice Studies. Uh, Friday, March 8th at 10 a.m. and repeated again at 11 a.m. in Sears Recital Hall, we'll have an anti-racist teaching a presentation given by Dr. Eddie Moore, Jr., who is the founder of the White Privilege Conference, and I'll mention more about this in a minute. Uh, from 3 to 5 p.m., we have dialogues on the campus climate for, div div for diversity at VWK Maine, and if you register early, you'll get a free dinner, courtesy of Housing and Residence Life. Uh, Saturday, March 9th at 1 p.m. in the River Campus is the key 
keynote presentation by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist uh, Nicholas Kristof, which is also organized by the UD Speaker Series. Uh, following the presentations, we'll have interactive student exhibits with guest speakers, and the students have been hard at work and we're excited to share these efforts with you, and I hope that you'll all come. Uh, today I'm honored to introduce Professor Michelle Alexander, and I first heard Michelle Alexander give a keynote presentation at the White Privilege Conference a few years ago. Now the conference is a huge annual event which usually attracts more than 2,000 participants who are scholars, activists, field organizers, and students. And some of you may know that our very own Dr. Vernelia Randall of the Law School was also a keynote speaker at WPC. And when Professor Alexander was presenting, I happened to get a seat in the back of the auditorium. This is a huge auditorium. And with this many people, it's not uncommon for folks to be moving around, whispering, et cetera. However, our UD students know the proper protocol for attending a presentation, like turning off your cell phone. It's rude to walk out in the middle of the presentation. The Q&A is part of the presentation. Uh, so we all know that we can get up and leave when Dr. Hassel Hughes says, and this concludes our presentation. I figure we all have that now. Um, so again, this was a huge conference at WPC. And yet when I heard Michelle Alexander speaking, the audience was captivated and hanging on her every word. Uh, when I heard her presentation and saw the audience reaction, I thought, oh, we got to get her here. So, uh, so I'm very thankful for the UD Speaker Series for allowing this opportunity. You should know that Professor Alexander is a highly acclaimed civil rights lawyer, advocate, and legal scholar. She currently holds a joint appointment at the Kerwin Institute of Study for the Study of Race and Ethnicity and the Moritz College of Law at Ohio State University. Professor Alexander served for several years of, as director of Racial Justice Project at the ACLU in Northern California and subsequently directed the civil rights clinics at Stanford Law School where she was an associate professor. She's a former law clerk for Justice Harry Blackmun on the US Supreme Court and has appeared as a commentator on CNN, MSNBC, and NPR among others. Her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, has won numerous awards, such as the NAACP Image Award and the Constitutional Commentary Award, and garnered international praise. Her book has been called Stunning uh, by Pulitzer Prize winning historian David Levering Lewis. It's been called Invaluable, Explosive, Profoundly Necessary, and A Call to Action. Brown University professor Glenn Larry writes, if you care about justice in America, you need to read this book. So I'm pleased to introduce Professor Michelle Alexander. Thank you. Thank you for that very warm welcome. Good evening. It is wonderful to be here and to see so many of you here. It's so encouraging to see so many people willing to engage in meaningful dialogue about this system of mass incarceration, a system that has devastated so many communities, destroyed so many families, and literally turned back the clock on racial progress in the United States. And I do think it is fitting that we're having this conversation during Black History Month, a time when many Americans pause, if only briefly, uh, to consider our racial past, our racial present, and our collective future, in particular the experience of African Americans in the United States. And I'd like to dedicate my talk tonight to the memory of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Um, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. 50 years have passed since Dr. King declared his dream and delivered his infamous speech, I have a dream, I have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. And as our nation celebrated uh, the national holiday dedicated to Dr. King this year, um, a fact that in itself is quite remarkable that we have a national holiday dedicated to Martin Luther King Jr., a man who was once deemed a threat to national security by the FBI, a radical troublemaker on the very day dedicated to Dr. King, Barack Obama, our nation's first black president, was sworn in for a second time. 
And it's, it is remarkable. And it is very tempting at times like this to imagine that we are now living the dream. In fact, uh, when I listened to President Obama uh, deliver his inauguration address, I heard echoes of King's speech. It was a speech that was firmly rooted in the rhetoric and narratives of equality um, that King and so many other racial justice advocates made possible in the United States today. But as I turned off the television set after listening to his speech, I had to sit quietly for a moment and reflect on the question, who shares in this dream today? Who is living the dream? Who is not? Is this dream merely a dream? Or is it, in some real respects, something that is little more than a fantasy for, for so many? And in reflecting on where we stand today, 50 years after King delivered his dream, I want to take Dr. King's advice and try to tell it straight tonight. Dr. King put it quite bluntly just months before his death when he said, quote, and again, this was after the civil rights victories had already been won, after the big civil rights battles were already behind him, that he said, quote, I do not see how we will ever solve the turbulent problem of race confronting our nation until there is an honest confrontation with it and a willing search for the truth and a willingness to admit the truth when we discover it. So in Dr. King's honor today, I'm going to do my best to tell the truth, the whole truth about race in America. It is a truth that many Americans will deny just as they were willing to deny the truth about slavery and Jim Crow in their day. But the truth is this. We as a nation have taken a wrong turn, a tragic detour in our stride toward freedom. We have betrayed in so many ways Dr. King's dream. A vast new racial undercast now exists in America, though you rarely hear about it on the evening news. The media pundits won't discuss it. Obama won't mention it. The Tea Party would rather talk about anything else. The members of the undercast are now largely invisible to those of us who have cars, live in decent neighborhoods, and zoom around on freeways past the virtual and literal prisons in which they live. They are part of the other America. So many of us, I fear, have been lulled to sleep by the rhetoric of colorblindness and the appearance of great racial progress on the part of a relative few, the Barack Obamas, the Oprah Winfrey's, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice. We can name their names and we imagine that these examples of black success, black exceptionalism, speak of a triumph for all African Americans. In so many ways, I fear we have been lulled to sleep. Martin Luther King Jr. once said there is, quote, nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution, end quote. And he was talking about, at that time, about a profound moral revolution that was underway, a struggle for the dignity and humanity uh, for all humankind, a struggle to end what was America's latest caste system, then known as Jim Crow. And he told the audience a story about Rip Van Winkle, who fell asleep you know, for 20 years. And he explained that when Rip fell asleep, there was a sign posted on the wall of a 
nearby inn that had a picture of King George III emblazoned on it. But when Rip woke up two decades later, the sign had a picture of George Washington on it. And Dr. King pointed out that the most remarkable fact about Rip Van Winkle was not that he had slept for 20 years, but that he had slept through a revolution. He said, quote, there are all too many people who, in some great period of social change, failed to achieve the new mental outlooks that the new situation demands, end quote. Well, I think his words are as relevant today as they were back then. Many of us, myself included, have slept through a revolution, actually a counter-revolution, a counter-revolution that has blown back so much of the progress that Dr. King and so many other advocates risked their lives for and some even died for. This counter-revolution has occurred with barely a whimper of protest, even as millions of Americans, millions of people, have been rounded up locked in cages, and then stripped of the very civil and human rights that Dr. King and so many others risked their lives for. While many of us have been virtually asleep, a vast new system of racial and social control has emerged, one that certainly would have Dr. King turning in his grave today. I think one day we may look back and wonder how we could have possibly slept for so long. Well, I've been asked to share with you today the thesis of my book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness. And to a large extent, the title of the book speaks for itself. I argue that today, in the so-called era of color blindness, and even in the age of Obama, that something akin to a caste system is alive and well in America. The mass incarceration of poor people of color is tantamount to a new caste system, one that shuttles them from decrepit, underfunded schools to brand new high-tech prisons. It's a system that locks poor people, overwhelmingly poor folks of color, into a permanent second-class status nearly as effectively as earlier systems of racial and social control once did. It is, in my view, the moral equivalent of Jim Crow. Now, I am always very eager to admit that there was a time when I rejected this kind of talk out of hand. There was a time when I rejected comparisons between mass incarceration and slavery, mass incarceration and Jim Crow. Believing that those kinds of claims and comparisons were exaggerations, gross distortions, even hyperbole. In fact, there was a time when I thought that people who made those kinds of claims and those kinds of comparisons were actually doing more harm than good to efforts to reform our criminal justice system and achieve greater racial equality in the United States. But what a difference a decade makes. For after years, of working as a civil rights lawyer and advocate, representing victims of racial profiling and police brutality, and investigating patterns of drug law enforcement in poor communities of color, and attempting to assist people who have been released from prison, quote unquote, re-enter into a society that had never shown much use for them in the first place. I had a series of experiences that began what I call my awakening. I began to awaken to a racial reality that is just so obvious to me now that what seems odd in retrospect is that I, someone who cared about racial justice, had managed to be blind to it for so long. As I describe in the introduction to my book, what has changed since the collapse of Jim Crow has less to do with the basic structure of our society than the language we use to justify it. In the era of color blindness, it is no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt. So we don't. Rather than rely on race, we use our criminal justice system to label people of color criminals and then engage in all the practices that we supposedly left behind. Today, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways in which it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. 
Once you're labeled a felon, the old forms of discrimination, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of the right to vote, exclusion from jury service, suddenly legal. As a criminal, you have scarcely more rights and arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America, we have merely redesigned it. But like I said, I did not get to this place easily to say that I was a skeptic of those who made claims that mass incarceration was the new slavery or the new Jim Crow is an understatement. But I had a series of experiences over a period of years that began to open my eyes, that forced me to see what was hidden in plain sight. And one in particular I want to share with you tonight involves a young African-American man who was about 19 years old, and he walked into my office one day and forever changed the way I viewed not only our criminal justice system, but how I viewed myself as a civil rights lawyer and advocate. At the time, I was directing the Racial Justice Project for the ACLU in California, and we had just launched a major campaign against racial profiling by the police. We called it the DWB campaign, or the Driving While Black or Brown campaign. And we had already sued the California Highway Patrol for racial profiling and their drug interdiction practices. But we were looking to sue some other police departments in California as well, departments about which we had received complaints of discriminatory practices and tactics. And so we created a hotline number for people to call if they believe they've been stopped or targeted by the police on the basis of race. And we put this hotline number up on billboards and communities in Oakland and San Jose and different areas around California urging people to call the hotline number if they believe they've been stopped or targeted by the police on the basis of race. And in fact, within the first few minutes of us announcing this hotline number on the evening news, we received thousands of calls. Our system crashed temporarily. We had to expand our capacity to deal with the flood of calls that were coming in. So I was spending my day interviewing one young black or brown man after another who had been stopped, searched, frisked, sometimes brutalized by the police for no apparent reason other than race. And it was getting late in the afternoon and I was, I was getting a little tired, done a lot of interviews that day, and this young man walks into my office carrying a stack of papers about this thick. He had taken detailed notes of his encounters with the police in Oakland over a nine month period of time documenting every stop, frisk on the street, every time his vehicle had been pulled over, every encounter he had had with the police in a nine month period of time, descriptions of every encounter. He had names of witnesses who could corroborate what had happened. He had names of officers, in some cases even had badge numbers. Just an unbelievable amount of documentation and detail about this pattern of stops and searches he had experienced in his neighborhood. And the conduct he was describing by the police was similar to the stories we had, other stories we had heard coming out of his neighborhood about the tactics that they were using in his community. And so I started to think, well, maybe he's the one. <laughs> Maybe he could be our name plaintiff in a class action suit or planning to file against the Oakland Police Department with all of this documentation and detail. He, this, he could be the one. And to make matters better, he was a good looking young man. He was good looking, he was charismatic, he was well spoken. I thought, he'll do great with the media, he'll be good in front of a jury. So I start asking more questions, I'm getting excited and then he says something that makes me pause. And I said to him, what did, what did you just say? Did you just say you're a drug felon? Did you just say you're a drug felon? And he gets quiet for a moment. And he's just staring down at the table. And there's a long pause. And then finally, he looks up and looks me right in the eye. And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a drug felon. But let me tell you what happened to me. The police planted drugs on me, and they set up me and my friend, and they beat us up. And he starts telling me this big story about how he was framed and drugs were planted on him by the police. And I was just like, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am not going to be able to represent you 
if you're a drug felon. We had actually been screening people uh, with prior criminal records. When people call our hotline number, we would send a form to them to fill out asking a bunch of questions about their experiences with their police. And one of them was, have you ever been convicted of a felony? We believed we could not represent someone who had a felony record as a name plaintiff in a racial profiling suit because we knew that if we did, law enforcement and the media would be all over us saying, well, of course the police should be keeping their eye on him. He's a criminal. He's a felon. They're doing their job. And we knew we wouldn't be able to put someone with a criminal record, felony record, on the stand as a name plaintiff without him being cross-examined for an hour about his prior criminal history in front of the jury, deflecting attention away from law enforcement conduct and making it a trial about young man's prior criminal record. So we'd been screening people with prior criminal records, and he had not acknowledged his felony on the form. And so I'm just telling him, I'm, I'm sorry. I am really sorry, but we cannot represent you. And he starts trying to give me more information, names of those officers, those facts, people I can call. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry what happened to you, but there's nothing that I can do. To I tried to explain, I'm sorry, I know why this seems unfair and wrong, but there's nothing that I can do. And he still keeps trying to give me more information about how he was framed and set up. And then he starts telling me, I just took the plea. They just told me to take the plea. If I just took the plea, I could just walk out of there. I would just get felony probation. That would be it. I wouldn't do a day in jail. I could just walk out with felony probation. So I just, I was scared of doing the time. I just took the plea. I just, I knew I couldn't fight it. I just, I just took the plea. I'm telling you though, I'm not guilty. And I said, I am sorry. I'm sorry. I can't represent you. And then he becomes enraged. And he says to me, you're no better than the police. You're no better than the police. The minute I tell you I'm a felon, you just stop listening. Can't even hear what I have to say. He says, what's to become of me? I can't get a job anywhere because of my felony record. I can't get a job anywhere. So I can't even get housing. I can't even get access to public housing because of my drug felony. Says I have to sleep in my grandma's basement at night because nowhere else will take me in. What's to become of me? How am I supposed to take care of myself as a man? Says I can't even get food stamps. I can't even get food. How am I supposed to feed myself? How am I, how am I supposed to take care of myself as a man? He says, good luck finding one young black man in my neighborhood they haven't gotten to yet. They've gotten to us all already. And with that, he snatches all of those papers up off of the table, and he just starts ripping them up, all those notes, starts ripping them up, throwing them in the air. And he walks out yelling at me, you're no better than the police. I can't believe I trusted you. Well, several months after that, I was doing a public access television show that was broadcasting live out of his neighborhood. I was doing public access TV because we were trying to organize several thousand people to protest the governor's refusal to sign racial profiling legislation. And we had been holding town hall meetings up and down the state, and now we were urging people to get on the bus in a few days and go to the state capitol to attend the demonstration. And so I was doing public access TV, broadcasting live out of his neighborhood. And the minute the show goes off the air, he comes bursting into the studio carrying this dirty potted plant. And he comes rushing in. And he's emotional, practically on the verge of tears. And he comes rushing in, and he thrusts this plant into my arms. And he says, I'm just here to tell you I'm sorry. I'm just here to tell you I'm sorry. I, I've been seeing you on the news. I've been seeing you out there trying to fight for our people, trying to do the right thing. And I shouldn't have treated you that way. I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. He said, I would have bought you some flowers, but I still don't have any money. So I snatched this plant off my grandma's front porch here. <laughs> And he shoves the plan into my arms, and then he turns around and takes off. He goes running out of the building. I go chasing after him, calling to him to stop so I could talk to him. He jumps into his broke-down car and disappears. Well, several months after that, I'm in my office. I open up the newspaper, and what's on the front page? Well, the Oakland Writers police scandal is broken. Turns out that a gang of police officers, otherwise known as a drug task force, had been planting drugs on suspects 
beating folks up in his neighborhood and who's identified as one of the main officers accused of planting drugs on suspects and beating folks up? Well, the officer he had identified to me as having planted drugs on him and beat up him and his friend. And it was truly only there that then that the light bulb finally started to go on for me. And I thought to myself, he's right about me. I am no better than the police. The minute he told me he was a felon, I just stopped listening. I couldn't even hear what he had to say. And that was the beginning of me asking myself some hard questions. I started asking myself, why is it, really, that we haven't been able to find one young black man in his neighborhood they haven't gotten to yet? What is really going on? And I also started to ask myself, what is the role that I am playing in this system? Refusing to allow the voices of the guilty to even be heard. How am I complicit? Now is the beginning of me doing an enormous amount of research and asking myself and others a lot of hard questions and listening more carefully to the stories of those cycling in and out of our prison system. And what I learned in that process was that my great crime wasn't in refusing to represent an innocent man. My great crime was in imagining that there was some path to racial justice that did not include those we view as guilty. And I also learned some facts that blew my mind. More African-American adults are under correctional control today, in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. As of 2004, more black men were disenfranchised than in 1870, the year the 15th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting laws that explicitly deny the right to vote on the basis of race. Now, of course, during the Jim Crow era, poll taxes and literacy tests operated to keep black folks from the polls. Well, today, in many states, felon disenfranchisement laws accomplish what poll taxes and literacy tests ultimately could not. A black child born today has less of a chance of being raised by both parents than a black child born during slavery. This is due in large part to the mass incarceration of black men. There was an article published in The Economist magazine a while back about this phenomenon entitled, How the Mass Incarceration of Black Men Harms Black Women. And the article explained that the majority of black women in the United States, including about 70% of professional black women, are unmarried, and that this is due largely to the mass incarceration of black men which takes them out of the dating pool. At the years, they would be most likely to commit to a partner, to a family. But what's worse, the article pointed out, is that by branding them criminals and felons at early ages, often before they're even old enough to vote, they're rendered permanently unemployable in the legal job market for the most part, virtually guaranteeing that most will cycle in and out of prison sometimes for the rest of their lives. In this way, mass incarceration has decimated black families to a degree comparable to slavery. Now, this phenomenon does not affect just some small segment of the African-American community. No, to the contrary. In many large urban areas, more than half of working age African-American men now have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. In cities like Philadelphia, DC, Chicago, the statistics are far worse. In fact, it was reported several years ago in Chicago that if you take into account prisoners, if you actually count prisoners as people, and of course prisoners are excluded from poverty statistics and unemployment data, thus masking the severity of racial inequality in the United States. But if you actually count prisoners as people in the Chicago area, nearly 80% of 
of working age African American men have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. These men are part of a growing undercast, not class, caste. A group of people defined largely by race, relegated to a permanent second class status by law. Now I find that today, when I tell people that I now believe that mass incarceration is like a new Jim Crow or a new caste system, people react with this shocked disbelief. They say, how can you say that? How can you say that? Our criminal justice system isn't a system of racial control, it's a system of crime control. And if black people just stop running around committing so many crimes, they wouldn't have to worry about being locked up and then stripped of their basic civil and human rights. But therein lies the greatest myth about mass incarceration. Namely, that it's been driven by crime and crime rates. It's not true. It's just not true. Our prison population in the United States has quintupled. It quintupled in a 30-year period of time. We went from a prison population of about 300,000 to now an incarcerated population of more than 2 million. We now have the highest rate of incarceration in the world, dwarfing the rates of even highly repressive regimes like Russia or China or Iran. We have a higher incarceration rate than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. But this stunning explosion in incarceration cannot be explained simply by crime or crime rates. During that 30-year period of time when our prison population quintupled, crime rates fluctuated, went up, went down, went back up again, went down again. And today, as bad as crime rates are in many parts of the country, crime rates nationally are at historical lows. But incarceration rates have consistently soared. Most criminologists and sociologists today will acknowledge that crime rates and incarceration rates in the United States have moved independently of one another. Incarceration rates, especially black incarceration rates, have soared regardless of whether crime was going up or down in any given community or the nation as a whole. So what explains the sudden explosion in incarceration, the birth of a penal system unprecedented in world history, if not crime and crime rates? Well, the answer is the war on drugs and the get tough movement the wave of punitiveness that washed over the United States. Drug convictions alone, just drug convictions, accounted for more than two-thirds of the increase in the federal prison system and more than half of the increase in the state prison system between 1985 and 2000, the period of our prison system's most dramatic expansion. Drug convictions have increased more than 1,000% since the drug war began. I mean, to get a sense of how large a contribution the war on drugs has made to mass incarceration, consider this. There are more people in prisons and jails today just for drug offenses than were incarcerated for all reasons in 1980. Now, most Americans violate drug laws in their lifetime. Most do. But the enemy in this war has been racially defined. Not by accident, this drug war has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color, even though studies have consistently shown now for decades that contrary to popular belief, people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites. That's right, or sell. Now that defies our basic racial stereotypes about who a drug dealer is. You know, if you picture a drug dealer in your mind, if you're like most Americans, you're picturing some black kid standing on the street corner with his pants sagging down. In fact, there was a national survey conducted on this question. In the mid-1990s, a national survey was conducted asking people to close their eyes and picture in their mind a drug criminal. More than 95% of respondents reported that when they closed their eyes, they saw a black person. Less than 5% saw someone of any other racial or ethnic group. So 
So when people imagine a drug criminal, typically think of someone who's black or brown. But studies have consistently shown that drug dealing and drug use happens in all communities of all colors at surprisingly similar rates. In fact, where significant differences in the data can be found, some studies suggest that white youth are more likely to engage in illegal drug dealing than black youth. But that's not what you would guess by taking a peek inside our nation's prisons and jails, which have been overflowing with black and brown drug offenders. In some states, 80 to 90% of all drug offenders sent to prison have been one race, African American. Now, I find that many people, when they see the data, they say, oh, yeah, that's a shame. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a shame, but, you know, we need to get tough on them, those people those folks in the hood. We need a war on them because that's where the violent offenders are. That's where the drug kingpins are. But many people don't realize that this drug war has never been focused primarily on rooting out the violent offenders or the drug kingpins. Federal funding has flowed in this war to state and local law enforcement agencies that have boost, boosted the sheer numbers of drug arrests. To a large extent, it's been a numbers game. Law enforcement agencies have been rewarded in cash. Sheer numbers of people swept in to the system. And to make matters much worse, federal drug forfeiture laws have allowed state and local law enforcement agencies to keep for their own use up to 80% of the cash, cars, homes seized from suspected drug offenders. You don't have to be convicted, just suspected for law enforcement to be able to take that cash off your pockets, out of your home, to seize your car and sell it. And the proceeds go back to the police department. These federal drug forfeiture laws have granted to law enforcement a direct monetary interest, not in ending drug abuse or even drug-related crime, but in the longevity of this war itself. And the results have been predictable. The overwhelming majority of people swept in to the criminal justice system in the war on drugs have been arrested for primarily nonviolent drug-related offenses. For example, in 2005, four out of five drug arrests were for simple possession, only one out of five for sales. In the 1990s, the period of the greatest escalation of the drug war, nearly 80% of the increase in drug arrests were for marijuana possession a drug that has now been shown to be less harmful or less addictive than alcohol and tobacco, and at least, if not more prevalent, in middle-class white communities and on college campuses as it is in the hood. But by waging the drug war almost exclusively in the hood, we've managed to create a vast new racial undercast in an astonishingly short period of time. Now, where has the US Supreme Court been in all of this? The supposed defender of discreet and insular vulnerable minorities? Well, far from resisting the drug war and its discriminatory application, the US Supreme Court has facilitated the drug war and the rise of mass incarceration at nearly every turn. The U.S. Supreme Court has eviscerated Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches and seizures. You know, it used to be that the police could not just roll up to someone on the street and stop them and frisk them without any probable cause or reasonable suspicion. Well, today, the police can do precisely that. They can stop, frisk, interrogate just about anyone anywhere without a shred of evidence of reasonable suspicion or probable cause, as long as they get consent. Now, what's consent? Consent is when a police officer walks up to a young man. The officer has one hand on his gun, and he says, son, put your hands up in the air so I can frisk you, will you? See what you got on you? And the kid says, uh-huh. That's consent, and that young man has just waived his Fourth Amendment rights to unreasonable searches and seizures. Fourth Amendment no longer applies to that interaction because the young man consented to that police encounter. 
Now, of course, the police don't do this typically on college campuses and universities to middle class or upper middle class white students or in predominantly white suburbs. No, they reserve this tactic for communities defined by race and class, communities that are typically poor, impoverished, places we think of as the hood. Now the discriminatory application of these kinds of tactics you'd think might raise some concern for the US Supreme Court, but no, the US Supreme Court, in a series of cases beginning with McCleskey versus Kemp and Armstrong versus the United States, has closed the courthouse doors to claims of racial bias in our criminal justice system at every step of the criminal justice process, from stops and searches to plea bargaining and sentencing. The US Supreme Court has explicitly ruled that it does not matter how overwhelming the statistical evidence of discrimination might be. It does not matter how severe the racial disparities are. Unless you can offer proof of conscious intentional bias tantamount to an admission by a law enforcement official of bias, you can't even state a claim for race discrimination in the criminal justice system today. Those racial profiling cases I was bringing 10 years ago, so many of them can't even be filed in a court of law today. The US Supreme Court has closed the doors to claims of racial bias in the system. And in this way, the US Supreme Court has virtually immunized the system of mass incarceration from judicial scrutiny for racial bias, much in the same way that it once rallied to the defense of slavery and Jim Crow in their day. And yes, the system has been immunized by these decisions. Why? Well, because most law enforcement officials, like the rest of us, know better than to state our racial biases out loud. How likely do you think it is that a police officer will say, well, yes, Your Honor, the reason I stopped him, first to research him was, well, because he was black. No. And a prosecutor is unlikely to say, well, I would have given him a better plea deal. I would have given him another chance, but, you know, well, he's, he's from, he's black kid from that neighborhood. You know he's not, he's not going anywhere. He's not up to any good. No. Most law enforcement officials wouldn't state their stereotypes and racial biases out loud, but more importantly, so many of the biases and stereotypes that drive law enforcement decision making operate on such an unconscious level that many well-meaning, well-intentioned officers can't even admit to themselves their biases. A good officer, well-meaning officer, sees a group of young black kids walking down the street with their pants sagging down and thinks to himself, well, let me, let me just jump out, frisk them, see what they're up to, thinking he's doing his job, making community safe. That same officer, seeing a group of young white kids walking down the street, would never occur to him to jump out, frisk them, have them lying spread eagle on the sidewalk, never occur to them. Now that officer may not mean those young black kids any harm, but those biased stereotype decisions play themselves out over and over and over again, adding up to enormous racial disparities that the US Supreme Court has ruled we can't even challenge in a court of law. The New York Police Department reported recently that in one year alone, one year alone, their police officers stopped and frisked more than 600,000 people. 600,000 people, overwhelmingly black and brown men. Those racial disparities wind up creating extreme disparities down the road and destroy the life chances of young people who are saddled with criminal convictions that follow them for the rest of their lives. Because being swept into this system with little hope of challenging the bias or the stereotypes or the war that got you there is just the beginning for so many. Because once you're swept in and branded a criminal or felon, you're ushered into a parallel social universe where the basic civil and human rights that apply to the rest of us no longer apply to you. Discrimination is legal in virtually every facet of life. For the rest of your life, you've got to check that box on employment applications, asking that dreaded question, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And it doesn't matter if that felony happened a few weeks ago or a few months ago or 50 years ago. If 
for the rest of your life checking that box, knowing full well the odds are high that application is going straight to the trash. People will often say to me, oh, come on, you're making excuses for people. Yeah, it may be hard when you get released from prison, but if you really try, if you really try, you, you know, you can get a job, you can get a job at McDonald's or something. Getting a job at McDonald's is no easy feat with a felony record. Here in Ohio, professional licenses are off limits. Tons of professional licenses off people convicted of felonies. You may not even be able to get a license to be a barber if you've been convicted of a felony. You're released from prison. What, what, what are you expected to do? Can't get a job. Discrimination is housing. It's perfectly legal. Private landlords as well as public housing projects free to discriminate against you and frequently close their doors. Discrimination in public benefits, perfectly legal. In fact, under federal law, you're deemed ineligible even for food stamps for the rest of your life if you've been convicted of a drug felony. Fortunately, many states have now opted out of the federal ban on food stamps for drug offenders, but it remains the case that thousands of people can't even get food, food stamps, to survive because they were once caught with drugs. What do we expect people to do? Released from prison, can't get a job, barred from housing, even food stamps may be off limits to you. Well, apparently what we expect them to do is to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support, which continues to accrue while you're in prison. And then in a growing number of states, you're actually expected to pay back the costs of your imprisonment. And paying back all these fees, fines, court costs can be a condition of your probation or parole. And then get this, if you're one of the lucky few, the very few, that manages to get a job right out of prison, up to 100% of your wages can be garnished. Up to 100% to pay back all those fees, fines, court costs. What do we expect people to do? When you step back and take a look at the system as a whole, from cradle to grave, what does the system seem designed to do? Seems designed, in my view, to send folks right back to prison once they're released, which is what in fact happens the vast majority of the time. Nationally, about 70% of people released from prison return within a few years, and the majority of those who return in some states do so in a matter of months because the challenges associated with mere survival on the outside are so immense. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, first, I think it is incumbent upon people like me, civil rights lawyers, to acknowledge that we've allowed a human rights nightmare to occur on our watch. While many of us have been defending affirmative action and engaged in many important battles trying to cling to the gains, the so-called gains of the past, Millions of people, millions, have been rounded up, locked in cages, and stripped of the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement. We have now spent one trillion dollars waging the drug war since it began. A trillion. We're constantly being told there's not enough money to pay good teachers. There's not enough money for jobs programs or economic investment in the poorest communities. But apparently we had a trillion dollars to spend, to blow, and we spent it building prisons and jails rather than investing in the communities that needed it most. So what do we do? Well, my own view is that nothing short of a major social movement has any hope of ending mass incarceration in America and re-inspiring a commitment to Dr. King's dream. Now, if you might imagine that something less would do, surely something less than a movement <laughs> would do, consider this. If we were to return to the rates of incarceration we had in the 1970s or the early 80s before the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement really kicked off, we would have to release four out of five people who are in prison today. Four out of five. More than a million people employed by the criminal justice system would likely lose their jobs. Most new prison construction has occurred in predominantly white rural communities. 
communities that now often depend on prisons as a source of jobs, or economic growth. Very often, prisons have been sold to communities as providing far more benefits than they actually deliver. But nonetheless, these communities now believe that prisons are their source of jobs, economic stability. Those prisons across America would have to close down. Private prison companies now listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and doing quite well, even in a time of economic recession. Those private prisons would be forced into bankruptcy. This system is now so deeply rooted in our social, political, and economic structure that it's not going to just fade away or downsize out of sight without a major upheaval, a fairly radical shift in public consciousness. Now, I know that there's many people who will say there is just no hope of ending mass incarceration in America. Just as many people were resigned to Jim Crow in the South would say, yeah, it's a shame, but that's just the way that it is. I find that so many people of all colors view the millions cycling in and out of our prisons and jails as just an unfortunate but basically inalterable fact of American life. Well, I am confident that Dr. King would not have been so easily deterred. So I believe that at times like this, Black History Month, times when we supposedly gather to honor the struggles that came before, at times like this, if we are truly to honor King's dream and all those who risked their lives for it, we have got to be willing to continue the work. We have got to be willing to pick up where they left off and do the hard work of movement building on behalf of poor people of all colors. In 1968, Dr. King told advocates that the time had come to transition from a civil rights movement to a human rights movement. Meaningful equality said could not be achieved through civil rights alone. Without basic human rights, the right to work, the right to quality education, the right to housing, without basic human rights, he said, civil rights are an empty promise. So in honor of Dr. King and all those who labored to end the old Jim Crow, I hope we will commit ourselves to building a human rights movement to end mass incarceration. A movement for education, not incarceration. Yes, a movement for jobs, not jails. A movement to end all these forms of discrimination against people released from prison. Discrimination that denies them their basic human rights to work, to shelter, to education, to food. Now what must we do to build this movement? Well, first, I think we've got to be willing to tell the truth, the whole truth. We've got to be willing to admit out loud that we as a nation have managed to recreate a caste-like system in this country. We've got to be willing to tell this truth in our schools, in our universities, in our churches, in our places of worship. We've got to be willing to tell this truth behind bars, in reentry centers. We've got to be willing to tell this truth so that a great awakening can begin. Because unlike the old Jim Crow, there are no signs alerting you to the existence of this new caste system. There's no signs. Back in the old Jim Crow, there were the whites only signs letting you know there was no doubt what was going on. Well, today, prisons are out of sight, out of mind. They're often located hundreds of miles away from home. And the communities from which people cycle in and out of prison are often segregated on the other side of town. It is possible, if you're doing quite well in America, living middle class, to live your whole life and have no idea what is really going on. If you're not touched by this system directly, you can live your life in denial, deep denial, about the reality of mass incarceration in America. 
So if we are serious about building a movement and shifting public consciousness, we have got to be willing to tell the truth, to educate ourselves and those around us, pull back the curtain, and help to make visible what is hidden in plain sight. But of course, just a lot of talk isn't going to be enough. A lot of consciousness raising work is not going to be enough. We have got to be willing to get to work. And in my view, that means being willing to build an underground railroad for people released from prison. An underground railroad for people who are trying to make a genuine break for real freedom. We got to be willing to open our hearts, our homes, our schools, our places of worship to people returning home from prison, people who need support, finding work, finding housing, perhaps even finding food. But we also have to open our hearts and provide love, support to people returning home from prison, and support for families who have loved ones behind bars, who are grieving the loss of loved ones behind bars. You would think that today churches might perform that role. But unfortunately, as I've been traveling around the country, so many people released from prison tell me that church is the last place they would go. That church is a place where they feel most ashamed, most fearful of being revealed as a criminal, as a felon. We've got to open our hearts, open our churches, our places of worship, so that people feel safe in this era of mass incarceration, safe to come out as someone who has spent time behind bars and still be welcomed, still be loved and cared for. And how do we create these safe places? Well, one thing that we can do is to admit our own criminality out loud, yes. our own criminality. Because the truth is we've all made mistakes in our lives. We've all done wrong. We're all sinners. We're all criminals. Many people will say, that, oh, come on now. <clears throat> I may be a sinner, but don't call me a criminal. <laughs> and I say, OK, well, maybe you never drank underage. Maybe you never experimented with drugs. If the worst thing you've ever done in your life is speed 10 miles over the speed limit on the freeway, you've put yourself and others at more risk of harm than someone smoking marijuana in the privacy of their living room. That's the truth. Oh, yeah. But there are people in the United States today, serving life sentences for first-time drug offenses. The US Supreme Court upheld life sentences for first-time drug offenders against an Eighth Amendment challenge that such a sentence violated the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. The US Supreme Court ruled, no, it doesn't violate the Eighth Amendment. It's not cruel and unusual to sentence a young man to life imprisonment for a first-time drug offense even though virtually no other country in the world does such a thing. So we've got to end this idea that the criminals are them, not us. And recognize that we've all done wrong, we've all made mistakes, we've all broken the law in our lives. But only some of us are forced to pay for those mistakes for the rest of our lives. After all, President Barack Obama himself has admitted in his memoir and elsewhere to violating the law quite a bit in his youth. He's admitted to using marijuana and cocaine. And if he hadn't been raised by white grandparents in Hawaii, and if he hadn't done much of his drug use on predominantly white college campuses and universities, if he had been raised in the hood, the odds are good he would have been stopped he would have been searched, he would have been caught. And far from being president of the United States today, he might not even have the right to vote, depending on what state he was living in. So this idea that this is about the criminals, them, and us, has got to end. This is about ensuring that children of all colors, people of all classes and walks of life, do not find themselves trapped in a permanent second-class status because of mistakes they once made in their life. This is about dismantling a caste-like system that operates from the time a young person is born and shuttled into schools that are failing them. 
been forced to reckon with, zero tolerance school discipline policies, forced out onto streets, hounded by police, stopped, frisked, searched, eventually caught doing something, and then saddled with a criminal record for the rest of their life. We've got to dismantle this system and ensure that all kids of all colors have a shot at meaningful opportunities that dream that King dreamed 50 years ago. But of course, just building an underground railroad and trying to reach out to prisoners one by one and supporting families one by one is not going to be enough either. Because just as in the days of slavery, it wasn't enough to build an underground railroad for a few, shuttling a few to freedom, you had to be willing to work for abolition well, today we have got to be willing to work for abolition as well, the end of the system of mass incarceration as a whole. And that means ending the war on drugs once and for all. We've spent a trillion dollars, destroyed millions of families, and yet rates of drug addiction and drug abuse largely unchanged. Illegal drugs are cheap, readily available as ever. We've got to end this war that we've declared a war that isn't so much on a substance but on a group of people and shift to a public health model for dealing with drug addiction and drug abuse. And we have got to end all these forms of discrimination against people released from prison, discrimination that denies them their basic human rights to work, to shelter, and to food. And last but not least, we have got to shift from a purely punitive approach to dealing with violence and violent crime in our communities to a more rehabilitative and restorative approach, one that takes seriously the interests of the victim, the offender, and the community as a whole. So we've got a lot of work to do. And if it seems like too much, if it feels overwhelming, it seems like it can't possibly be done, keep in mind that all of these rules, laws, policies, and practices that comprise this system of mass incarceration, they all rest upon one core belief. And it is the same core belief that sustained Jim Crow. It is the belief that some of us, some of us, are not worthy of genuine care, compassion, or concern. And when we effectively challenge that core belief, this whole system begins to crumble, begins to fall like dominoes. A multiracial, multi-ethnic human rights movement must be born, one that takes seriously the dignity and humanity of all people. And it has got to be multiracial, multiethnic, because although this war on drugs may have been born with black folks in mind, it is a war that has destroyed the lives of people and communities of all colors. And we see that the same get tough, divisive racial politics that helped to give birth to the war on drugs and mass incarceration are now leading to another prison building boom, this one aimed at suspected illegal immigrants. So we have got to be willing to connect the dots and build a multiracial, multiethnic human rights movement on behalf of all of us. But before this movement can truly get underway, a great awakening is required. We've got to awaken from this colorblind slumber that we've been in to the realities of race in America. And we've got to be willing to embrace those labeled criminals, not necessarily all their behavior, but them, their humanness. For it has been the refusal and failure to recognize the dignity and humanity of all people that has been the sturdy foundation for every caste system that has ever existed in the United States or anywhere else in the world. It's our task, I firmly believe, to end not just mass incarceration, not just the war on drugs, but to end this history and cycle of caste in America. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, we are going to take just a short time for questions. We have microphones in the aisles. If you have a question, please come to the mic right away. Get in line, and we'll take a few questions before we move down for the book signing.
over here. Uh, yes, ma'am. Could yes. Uh, uh, Ms. Ma Alexander, could you tell me what has been um, Eric Holder's response to the uh, civil rights violations? To this, say, to the, what has his been response to what? The civil rights violations, you know, like the uh, plea bargaining and all those kinds of things. Yes. Well, you know, um, it's interesting. I, you know, many people have thought that. President Obama in his second term might do something um, um, to speak out about the war on drugs and um, mass incarceration and that Eric Holder might do something positive in this regard. And um, I hope that will prove to be the case. Eric Holder though, you know, when he was the US Attorney in Washington DC was really a champion um, of the drug war as it was escalating. I know that he has now expressed real concern about the fact that people who are saddled with felony records find it difficult to find work and housing, and he's spoken about those challenges on a number of occasions, um, and has, I believe, asked um, you know, the HUD housing department to take a look at um, how the discriminatory barriers to housing are impacted pe people with felony records. Um, my view is that we cannot expect that President Obama or the Attorney General um, is going to do much more than tinker with this machine unless some kind of major push comes from the ground up. Um, politicians typically don't find it in their interest <laughs> to be viewed as soft on crime or um, to be expressing reservations about the role of law enforcement um, in our society. Um, I think that people across the political spectrum today will now acknowledge that the war on drugs has been something of a failure. Um, and so it doesn't take much political capital to, to say as much. And in fact, Obama's drug czar, Gil Kurlowski, did say that he doesn't want to call the war on drugs a war anymore because we shouldn't be at war with our own people. But we have yet to see any major shifts uh, in policy from the Obama administration or from the Attorney General. And I think if we want to see something major, that we have to be willing to do something major. And um, that means, I think, really organizing um, and demanding an end to the drug war in its entirety and for um, you know, the Obama administration to say we are going to end all these forms of legal discrimination on the federal level that are keeping people um, locked in a permanent second class status. Yes, uh, Michelle, my uh, question is not directly that. You don't have to answer any questions. Uh, this is my town, Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> and I, hadn't, uh, I got lost. I, hadn't, uh, I was on my way trying to find Kennedy Union uh, from years ago when I was at Wright State Student. I forgot where it was. But let's talk on the fact of racial. I, was, I, I listened to you up close and personal about the story about the, the police pulling over the black youths and... Uh, Profiling, searching. Well, I'm, I've been one of them for a long time. Mm -hmm. This is nothing new to me, what you said, okay? Mm -hmm. But I asked for directions to get here, and some of the white students didn't ran from me. It wasn't until I got ran into two sisters that showed me where it was. So I'm saying a <laughs> number of things, but the one problem I got when I get people, and, 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 and I love all people, but I've got to say this because nobody has said it. All our mass killings are been from white guys. Mm -hmm. They don't democratically uh, profile them, mm -hmm. okay? We may steal your lawnmower, your car, but we are not gonna molest your kids, okay? <laughs> so when you come to my house and wanna peep, well, Mr. Ringer, uh, am I safe here? No, nothing, nothing, nothing. Now which one would you rather have, your car stolen or your kids messed with, okay? So they blame, they try to say gun control, violence on TV, when you got twisted white kids that's doing this killing. I'm not saying it's aimed at them, but it's got to be, why are they not mentioned well, and profiled? 
Okay? I, I we don't we don't mass kill. We don't get dr in a pickup okay. truck and get drunk and go after white people. Well, you know, there I mean Thank you. I, I think No, you're not going to hush me off. It ain't your turn. I'm, let I'm her talk. No, no. I'm let's let's yeah. And then we're going to let other people ask questions. Okay. I, I, I just want to put that out there because i got a I, problem with this. I, I hear you. And then some of the, and I hear some of the ones that have done okay. mass killing ain't even been arraigned yet. They fry us in 20 days. We are hung. I can leave here now on Brown Street and get pulled over. And y'all see lights flat. Oh, he must have been had drugs or something. No. They've been doing us like this, Michelle, for years. I agree. And I understand your anger. So your anger is not crazy. Yeah. <laughs> your anger is not crazy. And you They don't get it. When 9-11 when when got bombed, I was so glad they got another person to hate now. They don't have to hate the black people anymore. But that, that, okay? that, the, 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 Go ahead, dear. I'm sorry. The, let me take your last statement first. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I actually gave a talk to a law faculty not that long ago. And at the end of it, um, a professor who I actually respect quite a bit said to me, you know, there's no way we're really going to end any of this until we give people someone else to hate. Right. That black people, particularly black men, have been the group that has been demonized <laughs> um, and has been you know, the outlet for a lot of fear and um, anxiety for a long, long time. And so this professor said with great deal of serious, don't we need to point to someone else right. to hate? Every society needs right. an enemy, someone to hate. And I reject that premise. And um, I think it is, it, I think that we have to be very, very careful about slipping into a position where we begin to feel relief and gratitude <laughs> that finally there is someone else to hate. Um, I confess that there are you know, many times when I hear about a killing or whether it's a mass shooting or a murder and I see that it's not a black man, where I feel, phew. <laughs> right. <laughs> because, you, because you know that the minute the black face is flashed up there what that means and what that represents. Right. So that sentiment, what you expressed, is understandable, but I think we have to be very careful um, when we feel it bubbling up and, and resist it because it is so dangerous. Um, and you know, in fact, you know, the example that you give about you know, another group to hate is having real consequences for that other group, the, the, mm. the unbridled hate that is being directed towards Muslim Americans right. in the United States is powerful and a dangerous thing. Right. Right. And so I think we have to be vigilant. If we're going to stand for justice, be willing to stand for justice for, for all people. Mm. The other point, and I'll address this just very briefly, which is that I think you know, you're expressing frustration that when a horrible crime or series of crimes are committed by whites, white don't, whites then don't get profiled right. and blamed as a group right. for those categories of crimes. I mean, certainly yeah. um, you know, we've seen that in a number of different kinds of examples. Um, and that's, that's absolutely true, and it's the reality um, that whites because they're not only the numerical majority, but they're understood in our society to be normal, the default race. Right. Um, it's Privilege. minority groups that are understood to be different and deviant groups that can be studied as right. such mm -hmm. and whose behavior, even if it's an individual, can be attributed mm -hmm. to the larger group. And that is a function <laughs> um, of our racial history and our racial present, and it's a reality. But I hope that our response to it isn't merely to channel rage to that group, but rather to find ways in which we can engage in a meaningful way um, with allies of all colors um, to work for justice on behalf of people of all colors. So I hear your rage. I just hope we can channel it in a constructive direction. So, yeah. so thank we'll you. Take a question from over okay. here now, please. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alexander, I remember the chapter where you talked about the prosecutors and their power, mm -hmm. but I don't hear any resistance from anybody to the, you know, they're maintaining that power, that control, or even trying to change their influence in terms of how our young people are processed. What can yes. we as a community do? 
to encourage a change and maybe a different way to look at some of those offenses to protect our youth? Yes, great question. Well, there's a number of things that can be done. Um, you know, one is that mandatory minimum sentences of any kind really have to be repealed because they shift the balance of power away from judges to prosecutors. Um, and so mandatory minimum sentences really give prosecutors all the power because ultimately a person's fate then de depends ent almost entirely on the charging decision um, of the prosecutor and judges no longer have the ability where they're mandatory sentences to be able to exercise their discretion and do mercy in individual cases or ensure that the punishment truly fits whatever the alleged crime might be. Um, so that's necessary. I also believe we've got to have far more transparency um, in terms of prosecutors. Um, you know, when I was you know, working, doing racial profiling work, one of our key demands was data collection by the police that would make it possible to track the race and ethnicity of those who were stopped and searched because back then, you know, more than 10 years ago, police departments were saying, we don't racial profile, that never happens in our department. And then when they actually collect the data, you see, oh, oh, they are stopping and searching people of color at grocery disproportionate rates, even though um, in many of these studies, whites were more likely to have contraband in their vehicles or be found with drugs. And so the data, um, help to force um, changes within some departments simply because the reality of their conduct could no longer be denied. Well, most prosecutors' offices aren't required to report about any <laughs> information about their charging decisions, the race and ethnicity of those who have been charged for what crimes, their, how plea bargains are being made. There is so little transparency um, that they're able to exercise their discretion with virtually no review or oversight as well. And there are many other you know, possible recommendations, and I encourage anyone who's interested in this to actually take a look at um, the Justice Policy Institute, which is kind of a think tank dedicated to reforming the criminal justice system, which has a whole set of, you know, I think worthwhile reforms. But even, you know, back behind the question of how do we reform prosecutors' offices, I think we've got to also be willing to end the drug war and stop the flow of young people who can be charged by prosecutors with harsh mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenses and reduce the flow of people who even you know, enter into the criminal justice system um, in the first place. We'll do one more question, <laughs> and then we really need to sign book. Okay. And um, this gentleman, I think, was actually standing the longest oh, of okay. those on the floor right now. So I'm. Okay. Gonna First of all, thank you uh, so much for coming. This was a very powerful. Thank um, you. Evening. Um, <clears throat> our government is actively exporting this war on drugs to Africa, specifically mm. Ghana and. Um, Ivory Coast, Uganda, uh, have you ever thought of delivering this kind of message to them before they get this stuff started because they've got enough problems already? Yes, that's a great question. In fact, I was invited to speak in South Africa recently because South Africa, there's actually an emerging get tough movement um, in South Africa. and. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the book Race to Incarcerate. It's an excellent book by Mark Maurer. And in that book, he describes how private prisons companies are looking abroad at new markets and kind of viewing you know, um, other countries as kind of new territory to be explored to kind of sell private prisons as an answer to you know, problems related to crime and poverty and social unrest in those countries. And so I think that there definitely is a need um, for those countries that you know, are now being viewed um, by many both internally as well as you know, by um, you know, those who stand to profit um, from incarceration here in the United States as you know, kind of places for expanding the system of mass incarceration. They need to understand what it is meant um, here in, in the United States. And so I think it is an important message to carry abroad. Thank you.
So I want to thank you all for coming. I'm going to make my remarks very short. Uh, I'm going to present in a moment a, a token of thanks to uh, Professor Alexander. Um, please take a moment to um, scan the QR code in your program or uh, go to our link to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on tonight's event. I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you for listening. Thanking you for bringing your concerns, your passion, even your anger um, to this really important critical conversation. Thank you to Professor Alexander for gracing us with her presence and her work and her concern tonight. There's a book signing in the first floor lobby, and if you didn't bring your own copy or get a free copy from Leonard Pitts, uh, you can buy one downstairs. We have paperbacks. Thank you. <laughs>